Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Praise God. You may be seated. Just, amen. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I, I, I wouldn't give you anything for a service where I didn't feel his presence. Amen. Uh, but you know, churches all over the country have church every Sunday, never feel him. Uh, I know that they say, and I know it's scripture that where two or three are gathering in his name, he'll be there in the midst. Sometimes that's all you have to go with. I've been in a lot of church services where if it wasn't for that scripture, I wouldn't think he was anywhere around. How many say amen? Because uh, I didn't feel him. I didn't see any manifestation of his presence. It's a lot better. I don't know about you, but just for me, it's a lot better when I come into a service and I don't have to try to use that scripture and say he's there by faith in his word. I can feel him. I can see him. I see people getting saved, delivered, set free. I feel his presence. Amen. Don't you, aren't you, don't you rather be in a service like that? Amen. Where you can say, I feel his presence. I see it. Thank you. Amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would, with me, the book of Matthew chapter 13. Amen. While you're turning there, once again, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your pastor and first lady and the family and all the ministers and whoever's in charge around here in all the different ways. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come and minister. Amen. You all have been a blessing to us. Thank you for the hospitality. Amen. You're taking care of our room and we went out and ate last night in fellowship and we had a great time. So thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 13. Are you there? If you're still looking for it, it is strategically positioned between Matthew chapter 14 and 12. Matthew chapter 13. You there? Now, if you weren't here last night, I told you I am an audience participation preacher. If you guys want me to hurry up and preach fast, you got to you got to shout with me and get get involved. If you guys just sit back there, I can preach for hours. Amen. All right, you guys can't be tired yet. We're just getting started. Let's practice real quick. I want to hear a practice shout. Ready? One, two, three. Let's just shout hallelujah. Ready? One, two, three. Hall That's good. Keep that. Keep that. Matthew chapter 13. Are you there? It says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that which was sown into his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, why is persecution showing up? Why is tribulation showing up? Because of the word. He says immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on good ground, he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. Lord, I pray that tonight, 
Lord, as we're here in revival, I pray you will revive us. Stir us by your word. Lord, we know it is your word that brings change in us. It is the word that causes us to be fruitful. It is the word that you are depositing in us that the devil is afraid of, and that's why he brings persecution. And Father, I pray that tonight that we would receive your word, that it would change our hearts, change our minds, that we would leave here different, and that we understand that no matter where we are in our walk with you, that there is more, there is greater. And Father, I thank you for that today, and I pray that tonight, Lord, that we would just step out of your way. Let not my words be heard. Take my broken words and feeble lips and Father deposit your word. Speak through me tonight that it would speak your word to your people that we would leave here changed. And Father, we thank you and we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, here in this text, very familiar parable of scripture, um, we read about the, the parable of the seed and the sower. The Bible talks about the sower sowing the word, and we understand the sower is the one that's spreading the gospel, sowing the word, sowing the infallible, incorruptible seed of the word of God. But as we read this parable, I want you to notice something. Uh, uh, three quarters of the seed that is sown by the sower does not come to produce fruit. Three quarters. We know that one falls by the wayside, one falls in stony places, one falls in the in the ditch, there, that the one falls on the road, and we find out that it three of those four never produce anything. But then we look at the fourth, and it says that they are on good ground, one out of four, and it says that it produces fruit in some thirty, in some sixty, and in some a hundredfold. So that lets me know, and that should encourage any ministers, a lot of times we get discouraged because maybe we're not feeling like we're seeing the, the fruit from the word that we'd like to see. But according to scripture, three out of four of the seeds never gets, uh, never produces fruit. It never comes to fruition. It might spring up for a season. It, you know, you have that one that'll get excited and come to church for a while, but then the cares of life show up and they never produce any fruit. Or that the, the enemy will come in and steal the fruit, steal the word out their lives before they ever get it and it never produces anything and but listen out of those of us who do hear the word of God and we receive it and we understand it we even in ourselves do not all produce at the same level tonight I want to preach to some good ground some people that have heard the word received it and are producing fruit but yet not all of us are producing. This is what the scripture says. Not all of us that receive it out of that 25% out of that good ground. Now look at somebody beside you real quick and say you're good ground tonight. You're hearing the word. You're receiving the word. Now out of us, the word is going to produce in some of us a 30-fold experience. Some of us a 60-fold experience. And some of us it will produce a 100-fold Experience. That's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 14, Paul was talking about these experiences. He said, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Just Paul saying that there was a high calling, it bears truth that if there are high callings, then there must be lower callings. Or he would just say, I'm pressing for the calling. Can I tell you tonight that as believers, that as we receive the word of God, it is going to produce different in our lives. To some people are going to be satisfied with lower callings. But if you want to receive higher callings, they don't just show up. You have to press. You receive the word, it deposits in your life, it begins to hit good ground, it begins to come to fruition. But if you want to have a higher calling, if you want to go towards greater things and more of what God has for you, then you have got to press towards that. That's something that's just not going to show up. That's just not something that's going to spring up in your life. Salvation is free. But if you want to walk under a high calling, you've got to press. He said, I press towards the high calling. Some people are satisfied producing 30-fold. They got saved. They produce in 30-fold. They're happy with that. They never strive for higher callings. 
Some people, they get up to another level. They get to 60 fold. I'm going to talk about that. Don't, I don't want to lose you yet. Some people get happy with the 60 fold and never press on any farther towards what God has for them. But can I tell you that tonight, no matter where you are in your spiritual walk, God always has more. I don't care if you've been saved 50 years. I don't care if you've been saved longer than I've been alive. I don't care if you quote scriptures, you stand behind pulpits, you teach Sunday school classes, you lead worship. God always has more. Do you know that no matter where you are in the kingdom, that you have still not yet scratched the surface to what God has in store for the believers? Matter of fact, your Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men what's he saying he's saying your natural eye cannot see your natural ear cannot hear your heart your psyche your mental reasoning cannot understand the things of God but he said he has revealed them to us through the spirit God has things for you and I that your eye can't see ear can't hear mind cannot understand but if you and I get into the spirit We'll be able to see the things that God has prepared for us. All throughout the scripture, we read about tri triads or triunes, three in one. Matter of fact, God chose to reveal himself to us as three in one. God the Father, God the Son, in what? Ah, oh, you all got a good pastor around here. Hmm. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three, yet one. If you take any of the three out, it is not complete. It is not a complete trinity. You, just, you can't have just God the Father, God the Son, take out God the Holy Spirit. It's three in one. That, that three together is complete. Two, one, two out of the three doesn't do you any good. You find it all throughout scripture. We find that the, the characteristics, faith, hope, and love. The greatest thing is love. We find it in the tabernacle. There was an outer court, an inner court, and a holies of holies. That made up what? One tabernacle. You couldn't have, you didn't have, if you didn't have the holies of holies, you didn't have a tabernacle. You could have had an outer court and an inner court, but without the holies of holies, it wasn't complete. Then again, you could have set up the holies of holies and not set up the outer court and the inner court, and you still would not be complete. It takes all three to make one. Do you know that you are comprised of three parts? You are a body. Actually, let's put it this way. You are a spirit. You live in a body. And you possess a soul. You are a spirit. You live in a body and you possess a soul. If I take any of those three parts away from you, you are not complete. If you take a, if you have a body but you don't have a spirit, you're not complete. If you were a spirit and did not have a body, you would not be complete. Why? Because it's three in one. Are you here? All throughout scripture, we see this triune that whenever God talks about it, that it has to be three in one. The mind, you know, the body, the soul, and the spirit. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the outer court, the inner court, the 30, the 60, the 100 fold. Now get with me. I want you to get this tonight. A lot of times when we talk about a 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold experience, we talk about you can either have one or the other. You can just either have a 30 fold or you can move up up and you get rid of the 30 and you now you start with the 60 and then after you've had 60 for a while you get rid of that and now you move up to 100 but tonight I want you to just look with me at the scripture I believe that God wants us to have all three experiences he wants us to have a 30 fold a 60 fold and a 100 fold experience and it's going to come up as we continue in our striding towards God 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. I'm trying, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Stick with me. I'm not going to leave you out here hanging. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, 
soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in order to be completely sanctified, you got to be sanctified in your spirit and your soul and your body. You see it. You see that triad there. Are you with me? Now I want you to look at this. And this is where we're going to. When we look in the scripture, we find out so often we are the tabernacle. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when you begin to look at it, we have a body. We have an outer court. We have a 30-fold experience. We have a soul, a holy place, a 60-fold. You see, you see how they parallel one another? We have a spirit which is the abode of the Holy Spirit, which is the holy of holies, which is the hundredfold experience. You see, now we're seeing this triad starting to work out in the spirit. Look here, let's go a little bit farther. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19, I'm heading there. It says, therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter into the holiest, what's it talking about? Into the holies of holies by the blood of Jesus. Jesus by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true conscience a true heart full of assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as this manner of some but exhorting one another so much more as you see this day approaching whenever you see this invitation as the writer of Hebrews gives it to us he does not invite us to the door he does not invite us to the outer court he does not invite us to the inner court but we have an invitation now through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can come boldly into the holiest we can come boldly into the holies of holies God has always been particular about who he allowed in his presence a matter of fact in the Old Testament only one time a year was the high priest on Yom Kippur allowed to come into his presence they went out to the outer court they came to the inner court but they weren't allowed in his presence and before they went into his presence they had to sanctify themselves and purge themselves and make themselves holy lest when they go behind the veil they drop over dead God is particular about how who he allows in his presence. Uh, isn't, you know, we are, are a privileged dispensation of people because you and I now have the invitation to go in where nobody else could go. He said, now you can go through the veil, which is his flesh, by his blood, and you can come boldly into the holies of holies. You and I have an invitation today that we can come into the holies of holies. That's where our journey is. And that's where we're going. We're going from a 30-fold experience to a 60-fold experience to a 100-fold experience. All of us have received the word. Out of us that have received the word, we are that 25% that has had the word in good soil. We understand it. It's producing fruit in us. Now it's time to take that fruit that's being produced in us and multiply it in some of us 30 and some of us 60 and some of us 100-fold. Are we all still together? All right, let's start off. He said, we have an invitation that you and I can come into the holies of holies. Now, whenever you would come to the tabernacle, that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. When you would come into the tabernacle, it was the largest room uh, uh, was the outer court. You would come in and there was a door at the outer court. There was only one door. That's a type of Christ. There's only one way in. Now, listen, we are starting our journey from the outer court and we are heading to the holies of holies. We are starting on the outside and we're moving ourselves inside. Can I tell you today that there is no other way to get to God except through the door of Jesus Christ. There's not a bunch of other doors. There's no windows. There's no back door. Jesus said, if you get in any other way than by me, you are a thief and a robber. He said, I am the way. If you want to get to the Father, Muhammad can't get you there. Harry Krishna can't get you there. Joseph of Smith cannot get you there you cannot become at one with the universe you can't get your karma right and get you there there's no other way to get to the father except through Jesus Christ somebody shout amen 
There's no other way to get to the Father. You have to come through Jesus. You got to come through him. And listen, when we look at this outer court, it's symbolic of the 30-fold experience. It's symbolic because many people, you know, when you would have the outer court, it was the largest room. There was room in the outer court for a lot of people. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of things happening in the outer court. There was animals bleeding. There was priests. There was blood flying. There was smoke going on. There was shouting. There was chanting. There was all kinds of stuff going on in the outer court. And so as soon as you would come in the door, the very first thing that you would see was the largest of the furniture. And it was a brazen altar. And on that brazen altar you could go no farther until there was a burnt offering placed on the brazen altar that allowed you to have access to go deeper can I tell you today in that 30 fold experience first thing you would have to know is that Jesus is the only way the next thing you have to know that if he was not our burnt offering had he not died on the cross of Calvary you and I would have no access to the father if he had not died and we did not see the smoke coming from the sacrifice you and I could not come into the presence of God this is the 30 fold experience the 30 fold experience is the salvation experience I'm not minimizing it we all have to have it the salvation experience consists of first you have to know that Jesus is the only way right then you have to know that had Jesus had not died and become the offering to become the sacrifice for your sin, you could not get any farther into the presence of God. You could not get to God had he not died. It would not have been, listen, the Bible talks about the sacrifice when even the Passover lamb or any of them, they had to be killed. It would not have been good enough for Jesus to be perfect. It would not have been good enough for Jesus to have never sinned. It would not have been good enough for Jesus to have never committed a crime to be found blameless in the sight of God and blameless in the sight of men had he not died. He would have just lived a perfect life and died natural causes. He could have never been the sacrifice. That's why he had to be crucified because he was becoming a burnt offering so that you and I could come in on a 30 fold experience understanding that he was the only one and only way and that without his death we could not go any farther are you with me we're heading somewhere huh? you go past the brazen altar and you would come to the levier the levier was a big I don't know the pictures of it look like a big basin it was it was crafted from mirrors if you study it they would take they took mirrors from women and they crafted them so it was shiny it was reflective and it was full of water and it was symbolic of two things one it could be symbolic of baptism because first you have to know who Jesus is that he is the only way you have to know that he died for your sins and then you, the Bible talks about one of the only two ordinances given to the New Testament church one of them is to be baptized right then also I believe it's symbolic of the word of God where you and I are washed it was where the priests would wash themselves they would go to the levier and they would see their reflection in the levier and then they had water in there that they would wash any blemishes or any things on them that did not belong that's what the word of God does for you and I when we open up the word of God we see our reflection and not only does it have the power to reveal and illuminate what our sin is but also he gives us the power so that we might be washed and be cleansed come on see that is what this salvation experience is all about it's about knowing that Jesus is the only way it's about knowing that he died to give you and I access to God and then living by his word and that's all you need to get to heaven if you have a 30 fold experience you can get to heaven you accepted Jesus Christ as the only way you believe that he died in your place, that the judgment of sin was placed upon him so that you could be free and you're living by his word. You're allowing his word to illuminate and show you where your sin is. You're seeing your reflection in his word. You're allowing the word to change you. You're, allow you're, you're beginning to live by his word. His word says don't lie, so you quit lying. His word says you're now aren't supposed to commit adultery, so you stop sleeping with people you're not married to. Ooh. It's, a, it's simple. It's just simple stuff. 
He tells us what we should do, what we shouldn't do. We see ourselves in the word and now we live by it. That's the 30-fold experience. How many in here have got that 30-fold experience? All right. The rest of you didn't raise your hand. We're having an altar call right now. We're going to go ahead and get you saved so you can get to the next part. Amen. We have that 30-fold experience. Now, can I tell you, that is the largest room, that is the largest part of the tabernacle or the temple there's a lot of excitement there's a lot of things going on there I don't want to minimize that in any way because you can't get to the holies of holies if you don't first come in the door you have to get saved you have to accept Jesus Christ you have to live by his word but you know there are a lot of people that's all the farther they go they have a 30 fold salvation outer court experience and never go any farther and like I said, that's all you need to get to heaven. But after you've been there for a while, wouldn't you like to know what's behind door number two? It's good to get saved. It's good to experience salvation. It's good to have all your sins washed away. Hallelujah. It's good to take a dip in that fountain that's been filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and which sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilt stains. It's good to go to Jesus and be cleansed and be washed and have access into the presence of God. But can I tell you that there is more? You don't just have to have a salvation experience. Think about this. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. The gift. If I give you a gift, I did not empty my bank account to get you a gift. If you bought me a gift, I would not want you to empty your bank account and give me everything you had to give me a Christmas gift. Amen? I'll give you a Christmas gift off of what I have left over. Right? I'll pay the electric bill, pay the water bill. My wife will take the rest of it and then the little bit that I have left, I'll buy you a gift. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. If the gift of God is eternal life, how much you think is in his bank account? If the gift of God is eternal life, how much more does he have for you? And there are people that are born, live, and die and never go past this uh, 30-fold experience, never go beyond the salvation experience when God has so much more for believers. How many want to go a little bit more? All right, so here we go. We've came in. We know that Jesus is the only way in. We know that he's the one who died for us. He's the, the altar, the burnt offering that's on the brazen altar. We're living by the word. We've been there for a season in our life. But the whole time that you're in the outer court, you keep looking at this next veil, this next door. It looks different. It's covered with badger skins and it's, it's covered with ram skins dyed red. And there's a glow in there and there's smoke in there. And every once in a while, you see priests going in there every morning. Morning, they get up, they bake 12 loaves of bread and they walk in and they come back out and you see them walking in there with this incense and they walk it in and they sprinkle it and smoke's gone in there somewhere and you see them carrying oil and they're walking in and you can, when they go behind that first veil, they go behind that for second door, you look in there you can see there's a little bit of a glow in there what's going on in there, what's happening beyond that, I'm going to tell you it's symbolic of a 60 fold experience and which God's calling us to, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you go into that second door, on your left hand side is going to be a candlestick. It's always to stay lit. The people would bring the oil. The priest would always keep the keep it full of oil. That there would always be a fire burning. It's symbolic of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. I, we don't have time to study it or to go into every detail, but if you'll listen to me, it, it's symbolic of the gifts of the Spirit. It's talking about the illumination of the Spirit, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophecy, discernment, uh, tongues and interpretation. It's the illumination of the Holy Spirit. When you're in the outer court, all of your illumination comes from natural sources. 
when you're in the outer court, when you're having a 30-fold experience, when you're out there, the sun gives you illumination. When The moon gives you illumination. But when you go in behind that first door, now the illumination is from the, the lampstand. It's being led. It's the Holy Spirit that is illuminating you. Whenever you're in the, the flesh, the 30-fold experience, you have the illumination where you can see with your natural eye. But when you get down in the spirit, now you begin to do the discerning of spirits, which means you don't see what's just going on in the natural. You begin to see what's going on in the spirit. When you're in the outer court, you have knowledge and wisdom that you and I pick up when we get educated. But when you go into the spirit, now you start to get wisdom that didn't come from, come on, somebody preach with me, that you can't teach, that you can't get educated. It's a word of wisdom that comes by the Holy Spirit. It's a word of knowledge, not because of something that you know, but because of something that the Holy Spirit gave you knowledge of. You're going into a 60-fold experience. You're going into more. You're going into greater. Now you see the gifts of the Spirit starting to be in operation. On the right-hand side, as you walk in, there was a table of showbread. It actually means table of face bread. It was where you would sit down face-to-face -face with God. When I used to sell insurance, they told me, and I know it's probably different now. That was a long time ago, but they said, if you can sit down at the dining room table, sit down there because that's where people communicate. That's where people people talk in the family. That's where people make decisions about what they're doing. This is how God set it up. He set it up to when you and I begin to come into the spirit and we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that now we begin to have the illumination and gifts of the spirit and now that our communication with God, our prayer life goes to another level. That's why the Bible says you don't know what to pray but he does. When Come on somebody preach with me. I thought I was still in a Pentecostal church church when you don't know what to pray he does I may say amen. I, there's, I don't know about you, but when I get in my prayer closet and start praying, it takes me probably 10, 15 minutes of praying in the spirit just to get the cloudiness out of my mind, just to get my mind from wandering. Why? So that I can get focused, so that I, come on somebody, the Bible says you can edify yourself praying in the spirit. There's something about praying in the spirit. Yes, you can pray when you get saved. Yes, you can pray when you're in the 30-fold experience, but when you come into a 60-fold experience, it revolutionizes your prayer life because now you're praying in the spirit. Now you're not praying from the mind. You're praying about the innermost part of your being, rivers of living water. Well, Y'all still with me? Y'all coming back tomorrow and I scare you off yet? Not yet. I still got a couple points left. You got the lampstand on this side. You got the table of showbread on this side. You have the altar of incense in front of you. On the altar of incense, every day they would go in, they would sprinkle incense, and it would become a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God, symbolic of our worship. Do you know not everybody can worship the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In the outer court, there's lots of praising going on. Salvation experience. There's shouting. There's praising. Praise him on the cymbals. Praise him on the psalteries. Praise him on the instruments of music. But it says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, that means not everybody's a worshiper. Praise is a 60-fold or 30-fold experience. But the worship has to come in the spirit. Oh, come on, somebody. You got to get in the spirit if you really want to be a worshiper. You got to because it's a revolution. Yeah, anybody can praise him. That's why we call it a praise and worship servant. Because some people just praise him because he's good. And some people praise him because that you know they are saved. But then there's another time when the worshipers start arising and they go into the spirit and they begin to put incense on the altar of incense and it becomes a sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of the Lord. 
it's there's a illumination from the outer court comes from natural things. Illumination from the inner court comes from a mixture. Because there's still men at work. The priest would come in and keep the lampstand full. The priest would bake 12 loaves of fresh bread every day. Bring it in. Lay it on the table of showbread. Take the old bread off. Put the new bread on. Huh? That's why we're supposed to be keeping fresh bread in God's house all the time. Amen? And so they would, then, then they would have to mix up the incense and bring it in and sprinkle it on the altar of incense. So it was a mixture. There was godly fire. The fire that was on the altar of incense was God fire. It was not started by man. It was started from God whenever he sent fire down. And that's why they kept somebody, that one of the Levites all the time had to keep the fire burning because they did not want strange fire. This was God fire. And so the lampstand that was burning was burning with God fire, but it was people that was keeping it filled up. The altar of incense was burning with God fire, but it was people that was putting the incense on it come on somebody that the land the, the the table of showbread was sitting down face to face with god but it was man that was making the loaves of bread to sit down at the table it was a mixture that's why your bible says the gifts are subject to the prophets that's why you can have somebody miss it a lot of people say well you know I don't think if somebody has a word of wisdom or word of knowledge or whatever, they should ever miss it. I believe the same way. I don't think they should, but they do. Amen? Do you know why they do? Because in the Holy Spirit, in that 60-fold experience, there is some man involved. And if you've ever operated in the gifts of the Spirit before, if you're not really tuned in with the Spirit, your spirit sounds an awful lot like your flesh sometimes. Amen. Huh? That's why, you, listen, you can't say it's not real because somebody missed it. Somebody told me I was going to get something in seven days and it never happened. It's not real. No, there's flesh involved. Yes, there's spirit involved, but there's flesh that gets involved as well. And that's why sometimes people miss it. I'm not saying they should. I'm not trying to give somebody cover that missed it. I think we should know what God's saying. We should be very particular not to say God said something when he didn't say it. Come on. But I also believe that, that there is flesh involved there because in the 60 fold experience part of the illumination is God fire part of the illumination is man it's a mixture amen and you know a lot of people go in that salvation experience and they stay there and then we have a lot of Pentecostal Assemblies of God people and any other church of God, any other Pentecostal denomination that receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and stay there. I got the 60-fold experience. God don't have anything else for me. I speak in tongues. I operate by the gifts of the Spirit. I pray in the Spirit. I worship. So that's all that God has. It got really quiet there. How dare us think that because we speak in tongues that we have everything that God has for us. Let me say amen. Huh? Just because you speak in tongues or just because you've operated in the gifts or just because that your prayer life, you've prayed in the spirit or just because your worship has been revolutionized. A lot of people think that there's nothing else behind that 60 fold experience. Some people think there's nothing else beyond the 30 fold experience. They think salvation is all that God has. And so they stay there for the rest of their lives. And then every once in a while, somebody will say, I want to know what's behind door number two and they'll get baptized in the Holy Spirit and the gifts will start operating and flowing and things open up in the Spirit but they never strive to go beyond that and they spend 20, 30, 40, 50 years of their experience not realizing that there's still another door that they've not been in yet. Whew. I knew 
it was going to be kind of tough preaching up to here. I didn't know it was going to be this tough yet. Are you with me? Are you all listening? You getting anything? We have a 30-fold experience, a 60-fold experience. But I want you to look at somebody beside you and tell them there's still more. There's still more. And listen, I'm going to be honest with you. When they went into the next door, it was called the Holies of Holies. It was behind the veil. It was the smallest room. There was no priests in there. There was no excitement. There was no animals. There was no shouting. There was no lampstands, tables of showbread, altars of incense. There was nothing in there whatsoever but one piece of furniture. And it was called the Ark of the Covenant. Right? On top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was a lid and it was called the mercy what? Seat. What was it for? There was one chair in that room. It was the seat where God sat. The mercy seat. That always puzzled me. Why would they call a lid a seat? It's because that's the place where God sat. Between the two cherub, there was a fiery glow. That the Shekinah glory, listen, you know, we know that the children of Israel were nomads. They traveled, they set up camp, they put all the tents together, they put the tabernacle, they put all their houses. And when the glory of God would lift up out of the holies of holies, they kept somebody always watching. Because while they were sleeping, God decided he wanted to move. And somebody had to say, let's get up. God's moving. God's going a different direction. And they would pack the tents up and everybody had their part. Some of the people carried the poles and some would wrap up the, the skins and some would carry the artifacts and they would follow God. And when he would set up in a particular place, they would set up the tabernacle right in the very center of the camp. And the glory of God, he would come down in that tabernacle and he would sit on his seat. In the Holy of Holies, there was one chair. There was no music. There was no shouting. But it was the seat of God. That's the hundredfold experience. It's God. It's knowing Him. I would be foolish to stand here and try to articulate and put in words an unfathomable God, a limitless God. I would be foolish to stand up here and try to articulate and tell and explain and orate what it would be like to know him in that hundredfold experience. But can I show you throughout scripture that there are men that knew there was more than what they had. Think of Apostle Paul. If you'll read the book of Philippians chapter 3, Paul begins to talk about his Jewish pedigree, begin to talk about all the things that he did, but then it says that he left all those things and he talks about giving everything up for Christ. Paul began to talk about his revelations. Matter of fact, the Bible says that because Paul had such great revelations that God gave him a thorn in the flesh that he prayed three times that God would take it and God said what? My grace will be sufficient. Do you know why he got it? Paul said it out of his own mouth. He said, lest I be exalted above measure for the great revelations that I had, God gave me a thorn in the flesh to keep me humble. Amen. So here was a guy that had such great revelations. The Bible said, you know the story of Apostle Paul, how Apostle Paul once was named Saul, but he was he, on the road. He was knocked down. He was struck and blind. He was in Ananias' house. You know the story. And then they sent somebody to pray for him that the scales fell off and he became the apostle to the Gentiles. And the Bible said after his conversion, for three years he went to the deserts of Arabia. And it says he neither spoke to flesh or blood or any other apostle, but he went out there and if you'll study the scripture it says he went out there so that he could have a revelation of who Jesus was 
evidently while he was out there, he had an experience with Jesus because look what the scripture says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, you can turn there if you want to. If not, just write it down. It says, and that he was seen by Cyphus and then the 12. He was seen by over 500 brethren at one time, talking about the resurrected Christ. Huh? There's enough eyewitnesses right here to put anybody in jail. You'd have to have a lot of trouble believing that Jesus did not uh, resurrect from the grave because look at all these eyewitnesses that saw him. If you went to a court trial and you had 500 people said they saw you steal a car, you're going to jail. Amen? And he was seen by Cyphus and the 12, and he was seen by over 500 brethren at one time, of whom the greater part remain at the present. Some have fallen asleep. He says after that he was seen by James and then all the apostles. And look here, and last of all, he was seen by me also. Paul said, I saw him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, as Paul's teaching the church how to partake of the Lord's Supper, he said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night that he was betrayed took bread. So evidently, I don't know when it happened. I don't know if it was on the three years while he was in the deserts of Arabia. I don't know when it was, but at some time, Paul had an experience with Jesus himself. Got a revelation of who he was, it declares. Says that he took communion with him. It talks about how he saw the resurrected Christ alive. The Bible says, Paul, let me just talk about him a minute. He had an experience, experiences that most believers would covet. Says he was caught up in the third heaven. He said, I was caught up. He said, I got up in a place I didn't know if I was in the flesh or in the spirit. He said, when I got there, I saw things that I can't even talk about. I heard things that I can't even say. Huh, are you with me today? He had a revelation of Jesus Christ. He operated the gifts of the Spirit. Matter of fact, everything that you and I, at least most of everything that you and I know in the church about decent and order and when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit come from Paul. As he penned it in his epistles and in his letters to the churches, he began to tell us how we should speak in tongues, how somebody should stand up and speak in tongues and then somebody else interpret it. How when we all come together, how we should not all speak in tongues lest somebody think we're crazy. Hello? He said, I'd rather you speak five words with understanding than 10,000 words without. But I speak in tongues more than you all. He knew all about the gifts of the Spirit. He had revelations of Jesus Christ. He was caught up into the Spirit and saw things and heard things that he was not even allowed to declare to us. Right? But look here. He said in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 that I may know him. That you might what? That I might know him. What do you mean know him? I thought you had such revelations of him they had to put a thorn in, God had to put a thorn in your flesh. I thought you were caught up in the third heaven. But he said, no, there's still more that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means that I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect or complete but I press on that I might lay hold for that which Christ has also laid hold for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or attained it but there's one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward for those things that are ahead. I press towards the goal or the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Paul had revelations. He knew about the gifts of the spirit. He had communion. 
communion with Christ, all of these things, but yet he said, I still have not attained it yet. There's still more. I, come on, somebody. I wish I had half a church. There's still more. There's still more than what I have. I'm still pressing for more. Yes, I've had revelation. Yes, I operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, I'm doing things for the kingdom. Yes, I'm actually writing the New Testament, but there's still more. Moses desired it. Think about it. Moses wrote the first five books of your Bible. The Bible said there was no other prophet like Moses because only he spoke to God face to face. He saw, let's think about this. Moses saw a burning bush. God spoke out of it said, take your shoes off. You're standing on the holy ground. He saw all the miraculous. He saw the plagues that brought the greatest dynasty of its day to its knees. Egypt brought Pharaoh and all of his armies. He saw the Red Sea open up. He saw the plagues, the locusts, the frogs. He talked to God. He spoke to God. Later on, he saw God with his own fiery finger Carve in the tablets of stone. The Bible said that there was a mountain that thundered and it shook and it quaked and nobody else was allowed on the mountain. And whenever the people saw it, they backed up. But Moses walked on past the people and went on up into the presence of God. Moses saw every day he saw the glory of God as they followed the glory of God as it was a cloud by day and a fire by night. When they got to the Red Sea and the Egyptians came behind them, he saw that glory go from in front of them from to behind them. And he guarded them and became their rear guard. Yet one day, after seeing all of that, you and I would think, man, I'm going to write a book. I can make money on that. I mean, I've seen fire. I've seen the plagues. I've stretched out my rod at the Red Sea and watched it part as we walked in on dry ground. And then I saw the sea come down and drown Pharaoh and all of his army. Yet one day, he was standing up and he said, God, show me your glory. What? What? Show you my glory. Look at what you've seen. Look at what you've already experienced. What are you talking about, Moses? Moses said, there's more. God said, I can't even show you all my glory. Nobody's ever seen all my glory and lived. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put you up in the cleft of a rock. And I'll cause my goodness to pass before you. And I'll let you just see the residue of where I've been. Is there anybody in this place with me? I'll just let you see my glory pass before you. And just allow you to see just a little bit. But can you imagine after all the experiences that Moses had. And yet he still said there's more. Are you with me? Tradition talks about Enoch. Huh. I'm not going to start quoting the book of Enoch or anything like that, but it's tradition huh, that Enoch would go into the presence of God and he would pray and then he would leave and go out and preach to the people and then he would go back in and pray and then God said, you got to go back out and every time that he would come back in, he would want to stay longer because he liked being in the presence of God. But God would say, no, you got to go out and tell the people what I said. Now, your Bible does declare that Enoch walked with God and the Lord took him. Translate it. Never saw death. But tradition says the reason is, is because he got to the place where he said, God, I don't even want to leave your presence. I know I'm supposed to go out and tell the people what you said, but it feels so good in here. I know there's got to be more. And so God took him. Huh. Are you still with me? Ezekiel saw it. He saw it in a vision. He said there was a river 
that flowed from the throne room of God. He said it came out from out from under the throne and it came down over. And he said everything that the river touched lived. The dead trees came back to life again. Fish and animals started living. Everything that the river touched, it lived. And he said, you know what? I got in with a man and I decided I'm going to have to go out. You know the story. Huh? Said he went out about ankle deep. 30 fold. Then it says he thought there's got to be a little bit more. So he went out knee deep. Right? 60 fold. Then it says he went out just a little bit farther. Waist deep. Went out a little bit farther. Got chest deep. Finally he came back with the, the, uh, the record and said this is too big to cross. There's water to swim in. And this river that's flowing from God, it's too big. There's more than I can handle. There's more than I'm able to comprehend. Listen, here's all I came to tell you. I'm not going to try to sit here and tell you exactly what a hundredfold experience looks like. But I can tell you that there are men and women that you just because you think that you speak in tongues and you have the gifts of the Spirit, don't think that you have everything that God has to offer because there's more there's more don't be satisfied with 60 when God has 100 for you Come on, somebody. Don't be satisfied with 30. If you're in this place and you say, Pastor Mike, I'm saved, but I've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Paul, the very first question he asked the church in Ephesus, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? If you were going to get it when you became a believer, if you got everything that God had to offer you, that would be a foolish question for Paul to ask a bunch of believers, have you received something since you believed? They were already believers, but Paul said there's more of an experience. You got a 30-fold, now you need to go to a 60-fold. And once you've been at the 60-fold for a while, you need to continue to strive and press on because God has things for you and I that our minds have not yet even been able to comprehend for I would say turn unto me says the Lord for I'm calling you in this hour in this day for I have greater I have deeper things, says God. I have things that if you'll call out on me and you'll seek after me and you'll search out after me, I'll do things that your mind cannot even comprehend. For I'll do things that you cannot understand. I'll do things that'll make you stand back in amazement at what I can do. For I would say, but all I'm looking for is somebody that will seek me. What I'm looking for is somebody that will search after me and not be satisfied with what you have and not be satisfied and complacent where you are. But that you'll say, I want more. I want more of you. And I would say, did I not say to knock and I would open up the door and seek me and you would find me? I would say, this is an hour that I'm calling people not just here but all over the world says God that will seek after me that will search me out so that I can show the manifestations of my presence in their midst says the Lord Whew. I think y'all just lift your hands for a minute and give them a little bit of praise and worship hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you what, I got a little bit more to preach, but for a minute, I think y'all just stand up for a minute. Huh? Just stand up in his presence. He's speaking to us. He spoke to us. He said he wants to do some great things in our midst if we'll just let him do it. And not be satisfied where we are, not be complacent where we are. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Come on, saints. I want to hear you pray. I want to hear you. Hallelujah. Call out on him. If you have a 60-fold experience, use it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whoo, Lord, we're seeking after you. God will stop everything we're doing. 
Oh, we seek after you. We want to see your face. We want to see your glory. <laughs> Let your glory fall. Let your glory fall in this place like never before. God, this church has seen great revivals, but we, there's more. There's more. Stir our hearts. Stir our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Huh. Hallelujah. You guys, come on back up. I'm done. Hallelujah. We've been invited into the holies of holies. We didn't been invited to come into the hundredfold experience. In the book of Ephesians, I was going to close out with the scripture. But Paul said that his prayer for the church was that we would know him. That we would know him. That the eyes of our understanding would be open. That we would understand his plan, understand his purpose, understand his glory. Huh? That we would know him. I believe that's what God's plan. I believe that's what he's trying, wanting us to do tonight. He's wanting to say, listen, there's more. Don't just be happy where you are. There's more. Don't just say, you know, I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. There's more. Don't just say, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's all, that's all that God has for me. What an insult to God. To think that that's all God has. There's more. There's so much more. Let me say amen. Huh. If you want more tonight. Huh. Listen, you have a great pastor. He's starting the congregation off in First Lady. Right where we need to be. I heard the voice of God. Know what God's saying. And he knows that where revival happens is right here on the knees. I challenge you tonight, if you want more, I dare you to get out of your seat and find a spot around here, down here, one of the, these steps or kneel at one of these pews. Come on. Do you want it? Do you want more? Do you want what God has? Come on, get, let's go. That should be your prayer. I want more. I want more. I just want to sit here at your feet oh. Caught up in this whole moment I'm not satisfied with what I have Never want to leave There's more Show me your glory Oh, I'm not here for blessing Show me your glory Jesus, you don't know me Show me your thing <laughs> more than anything you I've been here for can so do. long. I <laughs> just want you oh, to know you. Oh, to Caught see you. When you get past that 60 fold, you get me. Oh, I'm not here for this. That's all that's in the Holy of Holies. That's all that's in the hundred fold is me. Jesus, you don't owe For all the work, for all the striving, for all the pressing, when it's over, you give me. More than anything. <laughs> Woo! Red 
pray and just continue to pray continue to seek God but listen the 30 60 and 100 fold experience is not like a one singular thing we need to have all three you need to have a 30 fold experience at salvation you need to have a 60 fold experience where you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you need to seek after and strive for a hundred fold experience where you get God. That's what the hundredfold experience is. God said if you press through the 30, if you press through the 60, if you press towards the high calling, when it's all over, you get me. When it's all over, there's no lampstands, there's no priest, there's no illumination. In the outer court, the sun's the illumination. In the inner court, it's some illumination by man, some illumination by God fire. When you get into the holies of holies, man's not even allowed in there. The illumination is all God. Come on, somebody. That it just comes up in your spirit that God just tells you this, tells you that. Speaks this way, speak that way. It's illumination of the Holy Ghost. But you can't have a hundredfold and a sixtyfold if you've never received 30 fold you got to have all you have to know, come in the door you have to know that Jesus is the only way you have to know that his death on the cross is the only thing that allows you to live he died so you can live and you need to start living by his word repent turn Change directions in your life. Start living God's way. That's the salvation experience. And you can't go any farther with God until you have that. Is there anybody here today and you say, Pastor Mike, I'm here in this service. And I'm not where I need to be with God. And I want to get started on this journey. I want to get saved. I want to get things right with God. And so I can start striving to go into the deeper things of God. If that's you, I want you to wave at me. Because you're the reason I came. You're the reason I came. Is there anybody here to say, Pastor Mike, will you pray for me? If today I got out of my vehicle, got back out on 220, never made it home, my car went off the side of the road, or a vehicle hit me and I never made it home, I'm not sure I would spend eternity. You can know where you can spend eternity tonight. Not asking you to join a church, although this is an awesome church. I'm asking you to get saved. Is there anybody here today? You say, Pastor Mike, that's me. Will you pray with me? I wouldn't embarrass you for anything in the world. I just want to pray with you. Is there anybody? Just wave at me. Say, Pastor Mike, pray for me. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm ready. Listen, heaven's too real. Hell's too hot. And eternity's too long to take chances. Anybody? Everybody's ready? Good. Is there anybody here and say, you know what? I've got the 30 fold, but I've never got the 60 fold. I've never received the baptism, but I, I'm hungry. I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I need to receive. Is there anybody who wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You, you're saying, that's me. You're talking to me. I mean, this church is awesome. Bunch of saved holy rollers in here. Hallelujah. Now, I know we're all, look, I am. I mean, some of y'all might be in a better spot than I'm in. I'm searching for that hundredfold. I know it's there. I know that I, I speak in tongues. I operate in the gifts, but I know there's still more. And I'm striving for that. Is anybody with me in here tonight? Say, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm heading for a hundredfold. I'm not satisfied with sixtyfold. I've been here long enough. Thank God for it. But it's time for a change of scenery. I want to see what's on behind the next veil. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Man, I don't know. I, I just feel the glory of the Lord in here tonight. Man, I, I just hate to leave his presence. 
Hallelujah. I tell you what, let's just stand up in his presence for a few more minutes. Why don't we just go ahead and worship him? If Stand up or fall prostrate or whatever you want to do. You're in the presence of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. You're in the presence of royalty tonight. Hallelujah. Huh. It doesn't matter to me what you do. If you want to kneel down, if you want to cry, if you want to run, if you want to lift your hands, whatever you want to do, you're in the presence of your God tonight. (laughs) You're in the presence of your God tonight. And I While I'm getting ready to pray for this young lady right here, if anybody needs prayer for anything, I'll lay hands on you. I still believe God's a healer. He's a deliverer. I believe he can get rid of your depression, your anxiety. I believe he can do a miracle in your life. We'll pray for her right now. But if you need prayer, I want you to make your way up here right now because I want to pray with you. Amen. I know we're going to be here tomorrow morning. You're not, I don't know what God will do tomorrow morning. Right now is the time to get what you need from God. If you need something, make your way up here. you've uh, ever been in any of the things that I've taught on preaching there are two parts, content and delivery you got a clinic tonight on both that content is as rich as it gets and I said that as we started tonight, I'm going to tell you for all the things that I've seen God do in my life and others' lives I'm reminded that the greatest treasure is his word revealed and that, the word, of course, is Jesus Christ, but the word revealed of all the things that we get, getting that is marvelous. Thank you for being here tonight. We're going to have a great time in the morning. I should have told you last night, Pastor Mike said, call an unsaved person and bring them. We should have just said, call church people and <laughs> call central people and bring them. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that years ago then would go night after night. You would just start it. And the first 50 or 100 got broken through. And then that that paved the way for the next 500. And um, I just thank God. We, we need this right now. Amen. We need it. We'll be here in the morning at 10. And I uh, hope, hope you're able to be here. Let's get out of here tonight so you can rest. We can rest and be back in God's house. Father, thank you for the experiences. Thank you for each of those, the outer court, and the inner, and the holy. And may we never tire of hearing your word preached with anointing. May we never tire of worshiping and waiting Lord, when we get our attention, even in worshiping, when we finally are able to get our full attention off of what we see or we struggle with or we need or is happening to us, and fully on Jesus, remind us that at that moment, the things that we need are done for us. Bless this church, Lord. We're not the only fellowship of faith here in our community. But God, we have a pivotal place. We have much to do that we're not doing. Our city needs us. Bless this church in the breaking of this church. Multiply us as you've planted us in death. May much life be brought forth. And may we seek the fellowship of his suffering as Paul did. Lord, in the morning, may it be rich in this place again. May there be an an anticipation. Meet us here, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you in the Lord. See you in the morning, 10 o'clock.